Tonight, an explosive new weapon in the firefighter's arsenal. A rocket fuel remedy for nature's rage. Could this computer-controlled capsule be the only way to fly? All back on a stick. And can science help stem a deadly swarm? Taming the killer bees of Mexico. Natural solutions for the future, beyond 2000. And thanks for joining us. Also on tonight's program, Anthony tunes in to give us a glimpse of the TV news of the future. But first up, Caroline straps in for the ride of her life. Top Gun Flying School. The best flying the best. But what if you had the chance to climb aboard an F-A-18 Hornet and really push it? Thanks, come on, it's off, not off, set me. Hornet 1, you're clear for takeoff. Hornet 1, airborne. This is flight simulator Hornet 1 the latest generation interactive game that's probably as close as you'll ever get to flying the real thing. Thankfully, I've got company on this flight with a control pilot guiding my every move. But with Hornet 1, not only can you see and hear the action, you can feel it too. With the 1800 kilogram capsule attached to a computer controlled hydraulic arm, the pitch and roll of the craft is incredibly smooth. Far more exciting and versatile than other games on the market. All the action is choreographed by a silicon graphics reality engine with an impressive two gigabytes, that's two billion bytes of processing power that delivers an astonishingly realistic experience. I'm not sure if I wanted it to be that realistic. The simulation also involves having to attack targets and defend yourself from attack. That yellow square on the screen is part of a head-up display that's guiding me to my target. And you're clear to fire, Hornet 1. Bullseye, pull back. Pull back on the stick. Pull, pull hard, pull hard, pull hard. All this is the beginning of a move away from passive arcade video games to so-called simulation centres. Entire complexes devoted to interactive entertainment, where game capsules like Hornet 1 will be linked for network flying. That's good. Now pull back on the stick. So you can team up against the enemy or take each other on in hard-fought dogfights. And the possibilities go way beyond the classic battle scenarios. In the future, there will be software that says, or that will allow you to maybe just fly through a, a database and, and you'll be able to sightsee the Grand Canyon or, or, or some other landmark. You'll be able to have an adventure underwater or, or in space. Integrated into the computer-driven hydraulic pod, games like this skiing package could take you down the slopes of the world's best resorts. And it seems the race is on, with big players such as Sony, Paramount and Sega battling for the edge in what the industry calls location-based entertainment. 
Interestingly, Magic Edge, the company behind Hornet One, have steered away from the concept of virtual reality, with its data helmets and pressure suits. It seems for some that too much reality has its downside, with disorientation and nausea often accompanying the journey into virtual worlds. But here, the idea is very much plain fun. The cost of flying the system will surely be more than your average video game. But who can resist the thrill? I may not be high on the list for pilot recruitments just yet, but the cocktail of technologies in this cockpit is pretty addictive. So I'm going back for more. makes perfect. Still to come, taking new measures to get to the top. And next, how Russian rocket fuel could save lives back on Earth. The Kuwait oil fires, an environmental disaster of massive proportions. An apartment blaze, a towering inferno beyond the reach of conventional firefighting. A massive chemical fire, toxic fumes push firefighters back hundreds of metres. The fundamental problem in fires like these, hitting the seat of the blaze, particularly when the heat is so intense that firefighters and their equipment are forced out of range. Well, just imagine being able to launch a firefighting grenade like this from the air, from ground-based launches, into high-rise buildings or blazing refineries. Seven seconds after you pull the fuse, an impenetrable cloud of aerosol completes a satisfactory offensive. These are set to revolutionise firefighting, a new chemical combatant courtesy of some once-secret Soviet space technology. You see, ironically, the substance which snuffed out our fire is the same substance which causes this. Russian rocket fuel. The fire extinguishing aerosol system, or FEES for short, arose out of advances in rocket propulsion. Granted, that's probably the last place you'd go looking for a fire extinguisher, but the byproducts of the burning fuel are actually great fire retardants. Dismantling one of the grenades, it's surprising how simple the system is. These tubes are made of ammonia oxide, which acts as a coolant. And this is it. Nitrocellulose, or solid rocket fuel, combined with potassium nitrate, which is your standard garden fertiliser. When ignited, the two produce an aerosol which contains inert gases, including nitrogen. And the chemical reaction is so violent that these are propelled through the cooling system and out through these nozzles onto the fire. Fired manually, automatically by devices like smoke alarms and heat sensors, or electrically controlled, FEES attacks fires on two fronts. The aerosol particles go into chemical combat, breaking up the chain reaction which causes flame. At the same time, the gases remove oxygen, suffocating the fire. It's the only firefighting system which does both, and unlike halon or dry powder extinguishers, it doesn't attack ozone or need to be stored in a pressure cylinder. In this test, these three chambers were filled with a cocktail of methane and oxygen, which was ignited. Several FEES generators are then placed in one of the chambers, rigged up to go off automatically. The gases are once again pumped in and the test repeated.
While the gases in two chambers exploded, the third remained intact. Once ignited, the aerosol in the extinguishers nullified the methane-oxygen mix. Fees is being developed for use in all kinds of situations. A single canister is more than enough to snuff out small fires like these. Kuwaiti catastrophe or towering inferno, this rocket fuel remedy is fueling speculation about what could be a new era in firefighting. When elite athletes train, a simple game can take on the ferocity of combat. But in fighting for that winning edge, their bodies undergo a war of their own, battling the effects of a build-up of lactic acid or blood lactate. Blood lactate is an important means of measuring an athlete's condition and fitness. When we exercise, we draw on two energy resources the oxygen that's carried in our bloodstream and glucose in our body cells. As we burn this energy, we produce lactic acid as a waste product. During light, steady exercise, our bodies eliminate it as fast as it's produced. But push ourselves further and lactic acid makes its presence known. When lactate concentrations get too high, your muscles tire and your coordination is affected. It's the body's way of telling you to slow down. Ignore what it's saying and the accumulated lactic acid can do some serious damage to your muscle tissue. No matter what your sport, the fitter you are, the greater the delay in your lactate production. So measuring blood lactate levels is a good barometer of fitness. But high levels can also signal overtraining, something both athletes and their trainers can be slow to pick up on their own. Until now, measuring blood lactate levels was a time-consuming and clumsy process. Blood samples had to be sent away to a laboratory for analysis, and the results could take days or even weeks to get back. But now, with a simple device called AccuSport, trainers and their teams can get on-the-spot results with just a drop of blood. You don't need any special skills to carry out the test. AccuSport does it all for you. The test strip is impregnated with a chemical reagent, which combines with the blood lactate, creating an enzyme reaction that alters the colour on the strip. The device measures the degree of that colour change and within a minute comes up with a result. AccuSport automatically stores this information along with date and time, building a profile of the athlete's progress over a long-term training programme. The device can monitor the progress of up to six different athletes at a time building up a complete picture of team fitness. And if a closer check is necessary, blood samples can be taken a number of times during a single training session to chart minute changes that are the danger signals of overtraining. Well, immediately you can change the program around to suit the athlete. You don't have to wait three weeks now, or like we used to, say, four or five years ago. Your results are there. Uh, it's instantaneous. In the sporting world, where the competitive edge is so sharp it can be measured in milliseconds or millimetres, it's not surprising a drop of blood can make the difference between winning and losing. Later in the programme, how automation and home videos are really making news. Next, plugging into a cleaner driving future. The world's first full-scale program to test electric vehicles in an urban setting. La Rochelle, the beautiful and historic seaport facing onto the Bay of Biscay from France's west coast. 
It was the start point for many great voyages of exploration to the South Seas, and for centuries, a thriving export centre that grew rich from the trade with the West Indies and French Canada. For the past 20 years or so, La Rochelle has enjoyed a somewhat different reputation, that of pioneering measures to reduce pollution and improve the quality of life. La Rochelle sees itself as the green capital of France and a model of cities of the future. And the latest example of that ideal is this. Looks like a pretty ordinary car, doesn't it? But it isn't. It's all electric. Okay, you might say, so what? There are plenty of electric vehicles being tested all around the world. But this one and its 49 companions are very different. They're part of a dynamic new project, the world's first full-scale program to test electric vehicles in an urban setting. Two French car makers, Peugeot and Citroën, have combined forces with EDF, the French Electricity Authority, and the city of La Rochelle in the first stage of a scheme that will see the spread of thousands of electric cars through cities all across France over the next few years. The cars have been divided among 50 local people who were finally selected from hundreds of applicants. They pay a monthly rent of around $200 over a contracted period of 18 months, during which time Peugeot and Citroën will study their reactions to the vehicles. The controls are simplicity itself, just a brake and an accelerator pedal, with reverse just by pressing the R button on the dash. Theoretically, you can go just as fast in reverse as you can forward, but uh, I'm not going to try it. The dials are also extremely simple. They're basically the same as a regular car, except for these two. This one shows how much power is remaining, and this one is an economy gauge. But the most impressive thing for the first time user like myself is the lack of noise. They're wonderfully silent. Peugeot and Citroën don't intend these vehicles to be used for long distance driving. They're meant in this 18 month study to be used only in city driving. The maximum range is a little more than 100 kilometers which is why the recharging infrastructure they've set up for the new program is so important. There are three different ways of charging the car. The Electricity Authority, EDF, has set up a number of standard charging units like this at free parking spaces around La Rochelle, which will fully recharge the car in eight hours. Once the car is plugged in with the charging cord, the charging process is begun with a smart card that contains details of the owner's electricity account. So it simply goes on to the regular electricity bill at the end of the month. For more urgent recharging, if power is running low, there are three rapid recharge facilities that are set up at service stations in and around La Rochelle. These chargers are five to six times more powerful than the standard recharging units and they can provide 20 kilometers of driving in just 10 minutes of charging. And they also use the smart card. The third system is that available by simply plugging the car into the power supply at your home and leaving it to charge overnight. It's clear that France is serious about this project. Not only has Peugeot Citroën invested more than $100 million in preparation for full-scale production of electric vehicles, but the French government will now allow any company that purchases electric vehicles to write them off for tax purposes in one year. And the La Rochelle project is only the beginning. More than 20 cities around France, including Paris, 
are negotiating agreements with Peugeot Citroën and EDF to run programs with electric vehicles. The next experiment we want to do is to start a system of self-service vehicles, which would be accessible to anyone in a town. A credit card would allow you to choose a car and make your journey. Then you'd simply leave it where someone else could take up the same vehicle. This would allow good utilisation of the cars circulating the town and would avoid unnecessary parking places. With plans to produce around 50,000 cars by the year 2000, this new French initiative is set to give the concept of electric vehicles a significant boost. And we could soon be well on the road to a quieter, cleaner driving future. The next time you sit back and survey a tranquil scene like this, ask yourself one question. Harmless hackers or heinous villains? With all the finesse of a backhoe, they drive and divot, churning up the meticulously tended turf. But that's only part of it. They also stand accused on other counts. And the perpetrators of these vile acts? Well, it could be him. Or him. Or if you play golf, it could be you. Well, actually, it's really your golf shoes. Metal spikes may help your traction, but they also cause serious damage to greens. Repeated assaults by spikes damage the grass roots so badly they can kill off whole sections of turf. But these new soft spikes should eliminate all the bad points. Think about it like this. Each pair of golf shoes has 22 spikes. And you take an average of 26 steps on each green. So that by the time you get back to the clubhouse, you'll have left a minimum, okay, a minimum of 10,926 holes. Now on a busy course like this, that can mean up to 5 million holes per day. The soft spikes are made from a lightweight but extremely tough urethane plastic and will last on average for about 40 rounds of golf. And if you lose one, just screw in another. They have a thread that fits most brands of golf shoe. Even though they don't pierce the ground, the soft spikes provide very secure traction. And because they are soft, they're much more comfortable to walk on than metal spikes. The soft spikes also do their bit to prevent unwanted weeds and diseases from being introduced onto the course. Metal spikes not only tend to carry around seeds, they can also act a bit like a hypodermic needle, inoculating healthy turf with dangerous bacteria and viruses. It's estimated that getting rid of metal spikes may save clubs up to $100,000 in annual repairs and maintenance. Which means you can play a round of golf without leaving a trace. <clears throat> well, uh, maybe. After the break, how Mayan beekeepers are taming killer bees. These Maya Indians are preparing for a deadly assignment. The technology looks a little primitive, but it's all they've got. Their traditional knowledge of beekeeping goes back more than 2,000 years. But even that's not enough to help them deal with a life-threatening challenge, the consequence of a 20th century experiment. These are Africanized bees, descendants of African bees that were first released in Brazil 37 years ago. And not for nothing are they called killer bees. 
because depending upon your allergic sensitivity, it might take 70, 20, or just one bee sting to kill you. The dilemma for these Maya beekeepers is that although the Africanized bee is incredibly ferocious, it's also highly productive. It produces much more honey than local species of bees, or indeed bees introduced from Europe. Not only that, but their honey distilled from the jungle flowers around here tastes simply fabulous. African bees were brought to South America to toughen up European honeybees, which had trouble thriving in the tropical climate. But, like so many experiments involving introduced species, it went horribly wrong. The African bees turned out to be extremely aggressive and easily aroused. You don't need to be allergic to bee stings to risk death from these militants. When disturbed, entire populations are likely to come pouring out of their hives and attack in force, doggedly pursuing their victims and hunting them down. In the Western Hemisphere, the bees have reportedly been responsible for the deaths of at least a thousand people. Protective overalls and gloves, which the Maya cannot afford, are essential to avoid their stings. If we were talking about the killer bees taking over just a few hives, perhaps it wouldn't matter. But the Yucatan Peninsula has the greatest concentration of working honeybee colonies in the world and is the world's third largest exporter of honey. It's a business that has savoured the sweet smell of success. But now it's threatened with a sticky end, thanks to the African bees. The killer bees have colonised their new environment with ruthless efficiency. It took them just 30 years to cover the 6,000 kilometres from their release point in Sao Paulo across the Amazon Basin and Central America to Mexico. And in the seven years since the African bees arrived here, they've infiltrated the existing bee populations so successfully that now, genetically, these are 85% Africanized. For the gentle Maya, it's been a disaster. Living a quiet, self-sufficient existence in the jungle, a way that has changed little over the centuries, they've lacked the resources to deal with the ferocious invaders. And so, rather than risk death from trying to manage the killer bees, many have opted to chop down their forests instead, to grow more corn, the dietary staple from which they make tortillas. In the process, they're losing not only an important source of income from the honey, but their native forests as well. Funded by Mexican conservation group Pro Natura, entomologist Roberto Delgadillo Aguirre is working with the Maya to see if it's possible to reverse the colonizing influence of the Africanized bees. The tactic sounds simple, but requires skill and nerves. Basically, he's teaching them how to replace the current queen in a hive with a European queen, who's more placid. The queen is installed in a small cage, which is placed inside the hive. If she's rejected by the Africanized bees, they will kill her. It all depends on her pheromones, her chemical odor. Fortunately, the European Queen is alive, which means she has been accepted and can now perform her task of breeding and producing thousands of larvae, all of whom will carry her genetic material. And this is the rich prize awaiting the Maya if the hybridization procedure works. Hopefully, the result will be the best of both genes. More docile, less aggressive bees, but still with the ability to produce large amounts of the exotically flavoured jungle honey, so highly prized in overseas markets. Just as important, though, are the implications for other beekeepers, faced with the arrival of Africanized bees. Jungle honey isn't just a great taste. It's also, hopefully, a taste of things to come. The work of the Maya here, with their expert advisors, isn't just of benefit to the local economy and conservation. 
In North America, where killer bees have been found already in the lower states of Texas and Arizona, a $100 million a year industry is looking nervously southwards for solutions. The hybridization program in Mexico is the first to establish that controlled interbreeding of European and Africanized bees can be done successfully in a tropical environment. That offers North American beekeepers hope for the future. But it's not the only reason why it's worth the effort to tame the killer bees. Africanized bees have another equally important role to play in the jungle economy. As well as producing honey, they also help pollinate many of the fruit-bearing trees in the forest. That's obviously good for the Maya families who live here, but it's crucial for many animal species that live solely on fruit. Animals such as the endangered spider monkey feed on nothing but fruit. And as they're a popular drawcard for eco-tourists, the Maya see the importance of helping them to survive. And that's what the Jungle Honey Program is all about. Protecting a unique forest environment that has sustained a way of life over thousands of years. And hopefully will support future generations of Maya in the years to come. Up next, the TV news of tomorrow. I think you wind up bringing back a better story faster. The way we watch TV is about to change. Technology that'll let us have access to hundreds of different stations already exists. So the way television is made also needs changing. To survive, stations will have to be leaner and keener. New York is home to NY1, a cable channel broadcasting local news 24 hours a day to about a million homes. It's a new breed of TV station because it operates on about a quarter of the budget of a network news department. Mark Solis is a native of the Bronx, and that's his beat for NY1. Three, two, one. Grace Episcopal Church had just undergone $55,000 worth of restoration work. Now the challenge He's is called a VJ, a video today. journalist, and his church job description people. requires him to talk, shoot, and do sound alone. A one-man band playing whatever this big city calls for. You can just hold this like this. Okay. Uh, help me out a bit. Talk a little bit about the importance of this church to the community. This church sits as one of the few stable institutions in this community. So any reports of voting problems? Uh, only one incident. Uh, in all the... the architect of this news office is Paul Sagan. Before joining NY1, he had done his time winning Emmys for network news. Now he's much more interested in the future of television and how news will fare in a world with 500 digital cable stations and not much money. We looked at ways we could automate or streamline the process to eliminate the redundant functions and keep the core of the journalism and then the core of the creative and the important technical duties so that what we had was a more interesting product, more done more efficiently. And it's all possible thanks to this, video recorders which are light, cheap and user friendly. Clutching one of these, even the most inexperienced of us can get something meaningful on tape. Now NY1's VJs may have only had a crash course in shooting, but armed with their Steadicam high 8s they're getting the pictures they need not just to fill the stories, but in some cases to break the stories. Now it obviously means a drop in quality, but when it's a chance to scoop shots like the bombing of the World Trade Center, well, no one really minds. Sources say a huge bomb exploded on level B2 of the garage below the Vista Hotel. New York One obtained this video of the damage done by the blast. In this case, an NY1 VJ asked a firefighter to carry a camcorder into the restricted areas. Many workers were at their desk when they heard the explosion. These were the only pictures of the interior taken. No network camera person would ever have passed their camera over to someone else. But NY1's policy let them beat the rest, and these admittedly amateurish shots were the ones shown around the world. 
Professional camera people haven't been completely banished from NY1, but they have been kept to a minimum. Everybody at New York One knows how to do everything, or at least we try to get them to learn how to do everything. And the VJs think enough of the system to shake off the criticisms levelled at them by their unionised colleagues. I think reporters should know how to shoot. I think we should know a lot of the aspects about the business, inside and out. I think you wind up bringing back a better story faster. Rick Craig and I. The money saved on camera operators, lighting and sound technicians, directors, DAs and stage managers has been invested in computers and software. Back at the studio, it takes a little under two minutes and only one person to program 30 minutes of television. No stage crew has to be warned and no director needs to review the schedule. A robot will do the rest. In the master control room, a barcode scanning robotic arm easily finds the stories it needs from over 1,000 Betacam tapes. It then puts them into the six on-air VCRs, keeping this momentum up all day. A video jukebox, and all you need to program it is a PC. Grace Episcopal Church has stood on Vise Avenue in the Bronx. Back from his shoot, Marcus has used the station's online equipment to write and voice his story. He's done everything alone so far, but is now working with the editor to finish what is a very personal view of his beat. The shot of the Bibles, that's towards the head of the tape. As well as the five boroughs, there are VJs who specialize in New York schools, police, transit and city hall. ...was acquitted of the more serious charges against him. For bigger events, they use a full crew and have satellite-equipped vans. They can also use fiber-optic lines and they're working on sending back live reports to the station through cable boxes in people's homes. It's possible that the NY1 system might only be an interim measure before interactive technology takes hold. But even when we're able to choose the news we want to see when we want to see it, it seems that NY1's no-frills approach to news gathering will be the way. Next, getting the mail through a thousand times a second. The US Postal Service will today collect, process or deliver something like 570 million pieces of mail. There goes my contribution. While a growing number of people will choose to email, fax or use a courier instead, this country still accounts for a staggering 40% of the world's mail. Numbers like that make me wonder how they manage to keep up with the volume and keep down the price. Back in the 60s, the US Post introduced zip codes, and that set the scene for automation. In the 90s, this OCR, or optical character reader, can recognise the numbers in those zip codes at a rate of 11 envelopes per second. It also manages to spray a barcode onto every piece of mail that it can read to fast track each stage of sorting. A person can sort up to 800 letters per hour. The OCR, together with this barcode sorter, can zip through 30,000. That's OK if every address was machine printed, but in a world where people still like to put pen to paper, the Postal Service technology needs to get even smarter. And here at the Centre of Excellence in Document Analysis and Recognition, or CEDA as it's known, at the State University of New York in Buffalo, they've developed a prototype computer that can read handwriting. It isn't up to speed, but hopefully it'll be the basis of a machine that will instantly make sense out of the scribbles and scrawls on envelopes. It works by first scanning the address into the computer. The program then separates the image that needs reading from the background, 
so return address and underlinings are ignored. The different elements of the address are then colour coded. The computer first tries to figure out the zip code. If there's a problem, it uses information from the state, the city and even street name to help out. The system then uses its database of millions of addresses to compile a list of possibles. And then it cross-checks other details, like first letters, to find an answer. While the computer can't actually read like a person does, it can assess shapes when they're put into a context. Now we all know about the hard time that we doctors get about our handwriting. And in my case, my eights look fairly similar to my capital B's. But the system can differentiate between the two by assessing the characters that they're next to. So this shape followed by digits would be seen as an eight. Whereas the same shape followed by letters would be seen as a capital B. And CEDAR is looking at other ways as well to help the mail get through. Like this camera, which has been designed to scan 96 times faster than the one they use at the moment. The Postal Service plans to be using a machine that can read all but the most illegible envelopes by 2005. Writing that defies the system and plain old incorrect addresses will mean there'll always be a place for people like Chuck. Now here's one. Only has the street name. No number. But I've been doing this route for 18 years, so I know exactly where it goes. A radical solution to the problems of the Postal Service would be to abandon addresses altogether and give everyone a personalised zip code instead. A big part of the culture in this country demands a town name. We've become accustomed to that and uh, I, I think it'll be a long time before the people of this country are willing to give up uh, the sense of home that occurs with a town name and a street address. Chuck knows the people on his delivery route pretty well. The more machines can do, the more time he gets to spend being part of this community. If CEDA succeeds, then service, rather than sorting, will be the main job of postal workers of the future.